Hi everybody, I'm John Downing and I am a limnologist and aquatic ecologist and I prepared a series of modules or sessions on limnology and aquatic ecology and this is session 16 out of about 28 of them um, and this one is on the lotic benthos. Session 15 was on the lentic benthos, that is the ben benthos of, of lakes and ponds and in this one we will think about the um, uh, benthos of <clears throat> lotic systems, that is, systems that have directional and continuous motion, that is, streams and rivers. Um, so they're quite different, and uh, this is a very cursory lecture on lotic benthos. Um, there's a great deal more that could be done, as with lentic benthos or any of the other topics we, tr we treat here. Um, <clears throat> but my objectives for today would be to uh, have you learn how benthic environment, the benthic environment differs between rivers and lakes, and that's quite important. Then understand the main theories of stream ecology, learn about stream zonation. And of course, you know, the players are by and large the same between streams and lakes, except for their different um, taxa, or different kinds or different species of organisms, but they're the same groups of organisms, so we don't need to repeat that. And I'd like us to talk more about stream zonation, although we've covered that topic in previous sessions, and then understand some of the principal energy sources and learn about the ecology of major, major trophic categories of, or, of benthic organisms in lotic or stream ecosystems. Think about um, terrestrial aquatic exchanges and understand how streams have been stressed and modified over time. So rivers uh, differ from lakes in very important ways. And this is, a, again, a, a table from the CALF textbook. And <clears throat> you can look down the left-hand side of that and see what, how, uh, what the attributes are and how rivers and lakes uh, differ. In rivers, um, flow is horizontal and downstream. And then lakes, uh, uh, water movement is vertical and circul circulatory. Um, and uh, in uh, lakes, the uh, force that initiates movement is wind, and in uh, streams it is gravity and sort of downstream flow. Distribution of substrate is determined by water currents, and it's gravity-driven in rivers, and de determined, determined by wind-induced currents in lakes. <clears throat> water level fluctuations are often large in rivers and streams, and often minor in lakes, although can be large in the tropics. <clears throat> Flooding effects, therefore, on the biota can be traumatic and completely reset ecology and succession. And in lakes, they tend to be minor or, well, major in the tropics, where water level fluctuations tend to be large. Um, as we mentioned earlier on in some of the sessions, the water residence time in streams is very short, <clears throat> usually measured in days and weeks. And if I'm recalling right, the average water residence time of streams on uh, on Earth is something like 32 days, something like that. Uh, the water residence time in lakes can be long and is measured often in months or years. Um, the shape of rivers is very different, of course, and that seems very obvious. That rivers are very long and linear, whereas lakes are are quite um, short and oval. And uh, the re re uh, relationship, except in, of course, uh, river river-driven lakes uh, like uh, reservoirs or impoundments, the relationship, the uh, ratio between the catchment uh, area and the area of the water body is very high in rivers and re relatively low in lakes. Um, the groundwater to surface water drainage uh, ratio in the summertime is quite high in streams and and commonly in lakes is low to moderate. And this is demonstrated, as we discussed in earlier sort of uh, um, sessions on uh, sort of um, river formation and so on, and river flow, river structure. Um, the groundwater actually supply what is called the base flow in, um, in, uh, in rivers and streams. Um, so the mean depth is often shallow in rivers and often quite deep in lakes. Thermal stratification, of course, is very rare in rivers, and so they uh, provide less of a sort of thermal refuge, and um, stratification in lakes is quite common. Vertical chemical uh, profiles because in rivers, because of the amount of turbulence and water flow, um, it, it, tends, it tends to be very homogeneous sort of chemical uh, profile, whereas lakes uh, form into layers with different sorts of chemicals, uh, chemical um, species and, and concentrations in different places. 
dissolved oxygen is, is relatively high in rivers because they are quite turbulent oftentimes and flowing rapidly, except for in the most slow and laminar flowing uh, systems. But it, as oxygen, uh, dis dissolved oxygen in lakes tends to be quite variable and may vary among strata substantially. Nutrient concentrations, um, well, in rivers are often quite high and tend to increase downstream. And uh, nutrient concentrations in lakes, although this may be a little bit of an oversimplification if you think about eutrophic lakes and very modified catchment basins, um, you know, they tend to be a little bit lower, but tempor temporarily variable depending on seasonality. Turbidity in, in rivers and streams is often quite high depending on the underlying substrate, and in lakes can be quite low or maybe higher in the tropics or certainly higher in eutrophic systems that are subject to great river influx. Um, dissolved organic carbon in rivers can be high and is derived from allochthony. That is to say, if you remember what we've talked about in previous sessions, means it comes from the outside. Um, in lakes, it's a variable and a, a larger portion of autochthonous carbon, dissolved organic carbon sourcing although um, this uh, um, large autochthonous DOC is really only um, a very um, common in very eutrophic ecosystems. And nutrient retention in rivers, because of their great rate of flow, tends to be quite low, and in lakes tends to be higher, depending, of course, on the water residence time. So rivers differ uh, greatly from lakes, and of course, um, they will function in different ways and have different sorts of organism, organisms in them, depending on their functioning. So rivers are linked to the drainage basins, and uh, lodic systems reflect all kinds of aspects of those drainage basins, including the climate, the geomorphology, and the land use. Of course, they're almost a direct um, uh, fingerprint of climate, geomorphology, and land use. Stream characteristics um, that structure uh, stream communities would be things like width, depth, slope, of course, or stream order, velocity, discharge, Discharge variation, of course. Um, we learned the concept of flashiness when we talked about stream hydrology uh, some set of lessons back. Um, the substrate, the shoreline vegetation, and so on. Those are the aspects that structure those stream communities. There are several lodic ecology theories, and we'll talk about several of them. And some of them deal with the gradient, and some deal with disturbance. And the gradient um, that's uh, offered by a stream as it flows, uh, it flows uh, from um, uh, from the first order stream to the base level, uh, has a large effect on what happens, and it influences stream zon zonation. Uh, another theory that um, that um, uh, modifies function of streams or uh, describes the function of streams is a very famous river continuum concept that we'll talk about in some. Um, uh, in some detail, uh, also nutrient spiraling concept, and the hyporrhea corridor theory. Um, theories regarding disturbance I have to do with things like serial discontinuity, effects of abrupt changes, the flood pulse theory, and telescoping ecosystems, which is very closely related to nutrient spiraling concepts. Lodic uh, ecosystems are part of the landscape and um, uh, these are, offer other sort of theoretical constructs. And we'll, we'll talk briefly about aquatic terrestrial ecotones, about catchment hierarchies, and about hydrologic connectivity, something that is very important and can have a large effect on um, water quality downstream or in receiving waters. First, we've talked a great deal in other sessions about zonation, so we don't need to belabor it. But um, the sort of stream zonation theory uh, suggests that there are areas systematically within streams and rivers uh, of slow flowing deep water, often on the outside of bends, alternating with runs, which will be smooth, unbroken flow, connect, flow um, rates connecting riffle and pool areas, then riffles, which are um, a fast shallow flow over boulders and cobbles that break the water surface and all of these have an effect on what can live there. Clearly the kinds of benthic organisms you'd find in a pool uh, differs greatly from those that you'd find in a riffle. Uh, organisms living in a riffle would need to hang on, would have different kinds of food um, sources available and so on. 
Here's a here's some benthic organisms, not terribly benthic, but um, zonation. Here's zonation, sort of an agricultural sort of environment. You see, this is a channelized stream, but the stream is beginning to reclaim its meandered structure. Here's another view of zonation, and you can clearly see a sort of a alternation of runs and riffles in this um, lovely image. And here is zonation in a slower kind of system and, and which may be mostly very similar to pool habitat. Obviously um, a more calm ecosystem you can tell by the um, the growth of aquatic macrophytes, the, um, uh, the uh, lilies in the foreground and over on the far side as well as some um, uh, as well as some sedges and probably some bulrushes growing indicating very slow flow. The river continuum concept is one of the more famous um, theory sets or concepts in aquatic ecology and um, the, it's a fairly straightforward concept although it has been criticized by many and we'll walk through a few of those criticisms but it still is a really interesting way to sort of uh, organize our thoughts about what lives in the benthic, um, uh, benthic fauna of streams. And the basic concept is that there's a difference in energy source between the upstream reaches and the downstream reaches. Reaches. Um, the concept is that um, in upstreams, where streams are narrow and overhung by plants and uh, terrestrial vegetation, that a large amount of this vegetation will fall into the streams, and this is so, and and will um, uh, create a large source, of course particulate organic matter. This is made up of leaves and material derived from the watershed. Now as that material moves downstream it's processed by various kinds of organisms and the, uh, there is a more of a predominance of fine particulate organic matter and that is processed CPOM or coarse particulate organic matter and autochthonous production as one moves downstream. This is a, this is a basic fundamental um, foundation really of the river continuum concept. Now the idea is here that if you are your energy source is coarse you're going to need different talents to eat it than if it's very fine material and I think you can visualize from our discussions of in previous sessions on zooplankton and other atlantic benthic, or, uh, benthic um, organisms that um, upstream you will be looking at organisms that can tear apart material uh, as a, a predominant type of organism and in downstream you'll be looking at sort of filter feeding organisms as those who can function quite well um, those that are very much more similar to sort of the lentic um, uh, the, the lentic uh, benthos now detrital processing in stream is uh, this would be a, a sort of a schematic of it the detritus itself is crucial to stream function simply because they're not as reliant upon streams are not as reliant upon autochthony as are um, lakes and ponds. So um, detritus is very crucial. Um, if, if, so basically, um, what happens in this whole process is that um, bacteria attack this coarse particulate organic matter, and then organisms who are able to shred it apart begin to rip it into pieces, uh, releasing particles and uh, particles and dissolved organics and tiny tiny partic particulate matter as well. There's also um, uh, there's also an exchange of sort of alloctonous dissolved organics and inorganics in the presence of light that helps uh, micro and meso macrophyte primary autochthonous producers such as these and they will grow based on that dissolved organic matter and light that they again become um, uh, pretty much uh, detrital material and are processed by various kinds of organisms as they break apart. Um, in addition after the material is shredded and turned into shredding organisms, predators can eat those invertebrates and uh, they also can uh, be uh, eaten. Then these uh, larger predators such as fish or large carnivorous organisms um, will eat, um, eat so, uh, so even some of the predaceous invertebrates. So uh, the, the uh, production, sort of intrinsic production or autochthonous production then can be picked up by scraping organisms and uh, if those, uh, if those, part, if those 
um, if those uh, primary producers are quite small, they can be picked up uh, also by filter filters and collectors who pick up uh, that material and turn it into again to uh, uh, nutrient rich uh, food for several kinds of predators. So fish and large carnivorous stoneflies and grazers of attached algae are the only animals not directly involved with detritus. Um, they are indirectly invo involved with detritus, of course, because those um, large carnivores rely on that detrital uh, food source uh, to grow their food. Fungi, bacteria, protozoans, and so on convert the inedible cellulose and lignin into food, um, that, and, th and these processes are mediated then by nutrient uh, production. So basically the whole downstream process in the river continuum concept is mediated by this breaking down of larger material and running it downstream and offering it to different kinds of organisms that might um, live in those different ecosystems. Now, um, if asked, um, you, can, um, you can answer clearly, I think, that in general, uh, because of the predominance of coarse particulate organic matter that falls into streams in, in the upstream portions, that um, the ratio of fine particulate organic matter to coarse particulate organic matter should increase as we move downstream or increase in stream order. The ratio of FPOM to CPOM must increase downstream because of this shredding up and breaking up of detrital material, and that drives the river continuum concept. The agreement uh, of reality with theory is generally pretty good, at least as an overall trend, and although there are mediating factors. Um, but you can see here that, um, that in several of these cases, um, uh, from a work by um, uh, Minchel and others, um, that in several of them, the ratio of FPOM to CPOM increases. And in, in some of them, a few, you will see that um, there is some increase and then decrease and change uh, due to probably discontinuities in the function of the stream. And this all as we move from very low to, ver to much higher stream order. Where at, at low stream order, uh, we have um, a, a much, much, lower, uh, much lower ratio of fine to coarse particulate organic matter. Insects, of course, and I mentioned before that um, all kinds of organisms live in the lentic benthos and the lotic benthos, but insects are generally the most important in the stream benthos, and you can imagine why this would be, because the adult stages are quite closely, can be quite closely connected with a much uh, thinner um, water body, uh, you know, much uh, less deep and complex water body than they w would be for lakes, and, there f and also the exchange of adults with uh, the sort of uh, laying of eggs and so on in uh, streams would be uh, facilitated by the sort of shallow nature of these, um, of these streams. Um, uh, in fact, it has been suggested that uh, it, because, so many, um, because so many invertebrates drift downstream, if the adults were not able to fly back upstream, we'd totally run out of, um, of larvae in the upstream, um, upstream areas of streams. So insects are generally the most important stream benthos. And if you listen to talks at, um, uh, on stream ecology, you'll hear really a lot about larval insects. Same kinds of groups as we see in lentic systems, however. Um, mostly larval or larvae are nymphs. There are few adults. Um, and they're extremely important in most benthic communities. Um, and these organisms belong to a diverse variety of taxonomic and trophic groups. These are major sources of fish food and sort of the foundation of fly fishing and so on. And many of these organisms may be highly specialized to very specific habitats having to do with the flow regime and functioning of the stream system. In streams in general, we think of uh, four main trophic categories, um, and those would be shredders, and those would be the ones who would rip up the large particles, collectors, those who collect the small particles, scrapers who take small particles off of surfaces, and predators that take large particles in the form of shredders, collectors, and scrapers uh, in, uh, for their food resource. 
And we'll walk through those sort of one by one and uh, look at the various kinds of diverse feeding mechanisms. In the shredders, there are chewers and miners, and they, um, they c will um, feed on a variety of different kinds of things. The herbivores amongst the chewers and miners will attack living vascular plant tissue, where the detritivores will take large pieces of decomposing plant sh tissue and tear it into bits. And these are often things like the Trichoptera, the Lepidoptera, the Coleoptera, and uh, and the um, and the Diptera, um, uh, as well as the Plecoptera, that will uh, do this sort of shredding of material and begin processing so processing it so it can move downstream and become available uh, to other kinds of organisms in those uh, flowing um, environments. The collectors are a, another large uh, uh, t a group of of organisms, uh, including uh, some of the same uh, types of organisms, but expanding to the ephemeroptera, those would be the mayflies, the trichoptera, the lepidoptera, many kinds of diptera, and those would be things like flies, black flies, uh, midges, and so on, and some hemiptera, uh, some coleoptera, um, oh, and just a wide variety of organisms collect a couple of different kinds of material. There are filter or suspension feeders in the collectors, and um, and they will pick up um, living algal cells um, and um, and particulate organic matter that's free flowing, and then there are sediment or deposit feeders, much like we saw in the lentic benthos for the uh, sort of endobenthic organisms that would be gulping material, and they will eat decomposing organic particulate matter. So a couple of different ways of collecting particles. One as a filter or suspension feeder, another as a sediment or deposit feeder if sediment is able to build up. Another group, um, uh, another feeding group are the scrapers, and I think it's obvious to you from what we've uh, looked at uh, in previous sessions that some of the organisms scraping material off of, um, off of surfaces and streams would be um, things um, uh, things like the, um, uh, well, they'd be actually functioning very much like um, snails and so on. Okay, so pulling that material off. And these can be mineral scrapers, those scraping mineral surfaces, or organic scrapers, those scraping organic surfaces. Um, and that those organic surfaces would be um, algae and, um, uh, uh, well, algae, they would be sort of living substrata, or in some cases, non-living substrata, and of course, woody debris or logs and so on, would be or, uh, scraped by uh, organic scrapers. And but mostly the food would be algae and microflora. Likewise for the mineral scrapers. But this would be um, uh, algae and microflora attached to non-living substrata. Finally, the predators are a charming variety of um, uh, of, of, of feeding um, uh, modes. I. Um, once made a Halloween lecture uh, showing some of the horrible things that these um, some of the predators do. They're quite remarkable, but they divide up into a couple of um, types. Um, either those who swallow whole animals or parts of them, or those that pierce them and suck out the tissues. Those that suck out tissues would be things like the hemiptera and the ragionids, uh, the dipterans. Some of them will pierce and remove material. You, it's much like um, you saw in, say, the water bears, they would do similar sorts of things. Um, the um, uh, those that eat uh, that are um, um, predaceous and eat whole or whole animals or parts of them, of course, would uh, include the uh, odonata, and there are some spectacular videos of their feeding: Plecoptera, the Megaloptera, Trichoptera, Coleoptera, and various kinds of dipterans. There are um, carnivorous or predaceous uh, dipterans as well. So this is a river continuum concept sort of in action in a color image. And here you see first order to twelfth order down here, a very ambitious sort of diagram covering a huge variety of these systems. But uh, the overall picture here is the material falls in, the coarse particulate matter uh, falls into the stream. The streams are uh, at low order, very covered with vegetation in many cases. And um, so the, there's a, a large source of vegetation. You can have increasing growth of periphyton, that is uh, algae growing on surfaces, as the stream becomes more and more um, exposed. The uh, 
the shredders that upstream uh, shred up this material with the help of microbes and the collectors begin collecting some of it as it goes downstream. As we move into the higher order um, uh, higher order streams, vascular hydrophytes or aquatic macrophytes become more abundant and we get some input of coarse particulate organic matter uh, from those vascular uh, macrophytes but in uh, the shredders continue um, sh continue their work to a certain degree but by the time we're sort of at a mid-order stream then what we're seeing is a lot of grazers because we have um, very open uh, water course that uh, on which we can grow a lot of algae and bacterial food um, and we have collectors picking up the particulate matter so grazers and collectors make up the predominant amount the predators are are uh, with us all of the time because wherever there are um, uh, herbivorous or det detritivorous organisms there are going to be things that eat them although the predators change a little as we move downstream and then finally if we get into a very high order stream it becomes almost lacustrine almost like a lake and the collectors and f and almost and filter feeders will become really abundant or um, and you see even in this little image a clodocer and a copepod um, you know there can be sponges there can be uh, bivalve mollusks um, uh, palesopods and a variety of other kinds of filter feeding col uh, collectors collecting all the fine particulate matter including allochthonous and autochthonous material um, as it moves downstream. So that's the overall picture of the river continuum concept, a very important uh, theory. Production changes along the uh, river continuum concept and this is again a schematic here we see the ratio of fine particulate organic matter to coarse particulate organic matter as we move from first to twelfth order streams. And if you look at sort of the percent of the total invertebrate population made up of various um, kinds of uh, trophic, um, uh, trophic types, and this is a, a nice way of visualizing this, predators are pretty constant because there are usually invertebrates for them to eat. Shredders decline fairly continuously across this continuum uh, from low to high order streams because, of course, there's less material to shred as one moves downstream. It's most of it's been processed. At mid order streams, the grazers tend to be very abundant, and these would be snails and caddisflies and other things that scrape material from surfaces. Um, but they are uh, somewhat supplanted once you get into low, uh, very high order streams with high flow because you have less sort of exposed uh, substrat stratum for the, for the grazers to work on and you have much more deposited material of this fine material that's moving downstream. And then, um, then uh, of course, the collectors become predominant and make up a very large fraction of the organisms once you're in very high, uh, higher, um, high order stream um, because of the amount of deposition of fine particulate matter. Um, in, in, uh, this is a how uh, sort of there used to be an old sort of fish based zonation scheme of streams that you'd have sort of trout upstream re uh, placed downstream by carp and bream and other things and with uh, perches in the middle and various min uh, minnows and so on. Uh, in the sort of the grazing range of the stream, but this is kind of how these two uh, concepts sort of fit together. So this is another view. This is from the older CALF text, not the new version, showing the same kind of picture just in another way. First order to ninth order stream, change from shredders to collectors, and this is from one particular stream. Here we have the same kind of thing, first order to ninth order. Uh, shredders replaced by collectors with intermediate grazers uh, coming into some substantial abundance in the mid reaches of the stream. That's the overall concept. There have been some criticisms of the river continuum concept, although it's a very nice framework on which uh, to construct our ideas. Um, the, some have asked what system this really applies to because we have so many landscape changes that occur. There really are no non-controlled streams that flow freely and frequently there are dams and land use changes that provide discontinuities to the continuum, the so-called river uh, continuum concept. And also a tree coverage has been substantially impacted and um, changes from one 
um, from one uh, climatic zone to another, and it can alter this ratio of fine to coarse particulate organic matter. Now, there are several publications outlining many cases where empirical data contradicts the river continuum concept, and this would probably be because rivers vary in a sort of a non-continuous sort of way on, in some cases. And also some have suggested that the functional classifications of invertebrates may be um, a little bit sketchy in that they um, are not constant with even within one species of organism. Um, originally we thought of the community as an organism doing what needs to be done, um, but in fact um, uh, the, the what kind of community uh, you have there will uh, be affected substantially by the sources of food and organisms' ability to handle it. Um, there are many common changes in river systems that aren't accounted for by the river continuum concept and uh, in that rivers are just not constant year-round. There are floods, there are periods of dryness and so on. So it has been criticized as an idea but in fact is uh, of a nice framework on which to hang our, our thoughts about benthic organisms in different kinds of environments. Next concept I'd like to take up is the nutri nutrient spiraling concept and this is um, the idea here is that there's an uptake and release of plant nutrients as water flows downstream. The thought is this uptake release cycle is a spiral as it moves downstream. If it were only in one place it would simply be a cycle, right? But since it's moving downstream it unwinds sort of like a spring. The focus has been on phosphorus, nitrogen, and organic carbon cycling as it spirals downstream. And there's th this, the concept of uptake length, and this is distance traveled by a substance once released before it's accumulated again. So you can think of this as how fast material is moved through around the spiral. Um, if you have several uptakes and releases of material, this can be thought of as spirals. And this can be used to compare nutrient or carbon retention among systems, that is its supply and its demand, and the length shortens as organic matter increases. So there's a, is, as energy sources are greater, um, the uh, length, uptake length shortens, and it shortens as temperature increases, obviously, because organisms in general uh, do things faster at higher temperature. Um, it also increases with discharge because sediment declines. So as discharge increases, then um, uh, then it takes a longer, uh, uh, the uptake length is longer simply because um, uh, water is moving farther per unit time. This is a way to kind of visualize uh, nutrient spiraling, and this is from Wayne Minchel's work. And um, we can have a v in... Um, there are a couple of characteristics that are important in distinguishing this sort of uptake length, um, uptake length uh, concept in that we can have retention of material being high or low and biological activity high or low. So in the case that we have both high retention and high biological activity, we see the rate of recycling being very fast and the distance between spiral loops being greatly shortened. Um, in the case that a retention is high but biological activity is low, then the rate of recycling is a little bit slower because there's not much biology going on. But the uptake length can still be rather um, short because of, of retention, uh, because of the high retention of material. Now, in these types of ecosystems differ with respect to their the ecosystem response to nutrient addition and the stability of the system and the the um, where retention is high and biological activity is high these systems tend to be conservative and stable where the um, retention is high and bio biological activity is low the systems tend to store material so they're retaining material and keeping it and ecosystem stability is still high. Now in some cases we may alter things like biological activity and retention through various changes, um, but where the retention of material is low but the biological activity is very high, then we may have fast recycling and very long um, distances between spiral loops, basically spreading out the nutrient spiral. 
And of course, where uh, retention is low and biological activity is low, then the spirals become very, well, uh, recycling is slow and the uh, distance between spiral loops gets to be very long. These tend to be, um, actually, the where uptake length is longest, um, they tend to be a nutrient exporting systems and um, the ecosystem stability is low in uh, wherever this spiraling is, um, where the uptake length gets to be quite long. Next, let's move to concepts dealing with the hyporheic zone and think about the definitions. And I've looked for some good imagery on this, but the imagery is a little bit hard to find. And, um, but there are many different definitions on the hyporheic uh, zone depending on the question. The hyporheic zone can be saturated sediment beneath and along the sides of streams and rivers containing both groundwater and surface water. So this is a mixture of groundwater and surface water. Um, if you have dug down along a stream, you'll notice that there is some uh, very great tendency for I've dug, while well, you dig down through the soil next to a stream, you'll notice that um, there is actually some flow in the, especially in the gravelly substrate. I try this sometime um, when you're fiddling around on a stream, dig down into a gravel bar or a sandbar and see what you see. And basically, this will be a transport of material along. It'll be a mixture of river and groundwater as the groundwater is entrained and invaded sort of by surface water flux through the uh, more porous parts of the soils. Um, Hyperreg zone can be defined as um, uh, subsurface water that contains a minimum of 10% surface water and it also can be thought of as a subsurface zone in which organisms Term, termed the hyporheos are adapted to interstitial conditions. And in fact, there are organisms that live very deep down into the aquatic organisms that live deep down into the groundwater. But these would only be really at the confluence of the stream flow and the groundwater flow. And this is kind of how you can visualize it. Here we have a stream here, and this is the wetted channel hyporheic zone. But also there's flow of the stream that moves through the groundwater um, and along through underneath gravel bars. And we can have things called floodplain hyporheic zone, which is uh, water flux running underneath the stream. Hypo means under, so it's under stream. Hypo rios, rios is river. Hyporheic zone is um, under the river. So you, you can have this actually in the floodplain um, area. You can have this also in the uh, uh, parafluvial sort of hyporheic zone in channels and gravel bars, and that's where I suggest that you kind of look for it if you're messing around with with streams, and also flowing directly beneath the stream. Hyporheic zone is a region beneath and adjacent to streams and rivers where surface and groundwater mix, and you'll actually have a mixture of the benthic organisms um, within those um, different, uh, uh, the, from the stream and from the groundwater. Hyporheic zones have several different functions. They're a link uh, to aquatic, a uh, link between aquatic and terrestrial environments. They, um, uh, hi they play a role in nutrient cycling. Obviously, flow is a little bit slower in the hyporheic zone, and so um, chemical processes can take, uh, chemical and biological processes can take, um, can uh, work longer on the uh, water flowing through there forms a very specific kind of habitat, habitat, and because it's a mixture of groundwater and river water, it performs a great deal of temperature moderation. Groundwater in general, in case you're um, not aware of groundwater issues, uh, groundwater, if you dig down um, you know, several meters into the soil, you're going to find water that approaches the um, average annual air temperature of a given place. Um, and um, and you can find your so it's usually you notice that well water usually is quite cool right so uh, this is because you're pulling groundwater that has a temperature that's much closer to the average annual temperature so if you're in some kind of temperate zone and looking at this in the summer the water can be quite cool so you mix that a minimum of 10 percent uh, 10% of it or something with the stream flow, and you're going to cool significantly cool and moderate temperature fluctuations. Likewise, the temperature of groundwater, of true groundwater, is pretty constant year-round. So that mixture is going to not have as large a temperature fluctuation as the surface waters of the streams do. 
And just very much like you see in lakes, uh, you have the temperature mod mod moderating um, aspect of, say, the hypolimnion of lakes because it tends to stick at right around, in at least in the temperate zone, right at around the same temperature year-round in the deepest water. Also, hypo hyporheic zones have been shown to be able to remove contaminants, again, because of their ability to cycle material because of the long contact time between biology and water. The next concept I'd like to talk about is um, a stream concept is serial discontinuity. And um, concern, there's a lot of concern with dams and impoundments uh, instead of pristine river systems. And um, the, the dams, uh, when they've been installed, actually we've been installing dams at a phenomenal rate ever since the, um, uh, well, since the Revolutionary War in the United States. So since the 1700s, we've been put damming up water everywhere. And, and some have, um, some have suggested that there is no unregulated stream anywhere uh, in uh, North America, although I think there are a few. But it's been argued that regulating structures such as dams reset the river continuum and change it. And they don't always uh, change it in the same direction. It depends on the kind of dam that you're talking about. Now, here's the concept. Here's the a stream order on the x-axis and some parameter that we're measuring. And in a natural stream, we may see that increase that um, parameter and then decrease over time. But what we, uh, whatever that might be, let's say it'd be grazer abundance or something like that, um, that you get a maximum amount of grazers, say, at some intermediate stream order. Well, what happens is when you put in a dam, then you, uh, in fact, I'd go even farther than this, you will tend to alter rapidly uh, that parameter and because you're impounding the water, slowing it down and making a lake-like environment. And then you're making an, um, uh, a lower order stream effectively below the dam. And you do this over and over and you may in fact keep that parameter from, from peaking. Um, so um, the uh, serial discontinuity uh, concept uh, suggests that a uh, regulation and change in these streams may in fact reset in some way the river continuum and alter the biology. There's been a lot of concern about this because um, of, of dam structures. There are many dam structures that are traditional and have just been there forever but really serve very little purpose except for creating an impoundment which is um, another another issue and, and, um, and so people would like to remove them uh, dams also sometimes, well, almost always impede the upstream um, migration of fish and other organisms and have caused a substantial amount of ecosystem change. So serial discontinuities reset and alter streams as well as cause, um, uh, as cause, uh, bar uh, as cause um, barriers uh, to um, transport of material and upstream, upstream migration of organisms. Another concept I'd like to talk about is the flood pulse concept of stream ecology. And um, basically, if you look at this diagram on the right, you'll see that from summer to fall to winter to spring, water levels change. And we've got, um, uh, in, in um, summertime, we may see, um, uh, we see very low waters, and we may see an export of material downstream. In wintertime, as the water levels uh, begin to increase, let's say, with, um, with uh, winter rains or snow melt in the spring, will move a substantial amount of material uh, back onto the, as a pulse, back onto the landscape. And then as waters recede, will, a lot of that material will be left and you will have created a pulse of productivity and change that alters, um, can alter the terrestrial ecosystem nearby. Um, it also may alter the um, uh, the uh, uh, fluvial uh, ecosystem by the export of a substantial amount of terrestrial material in a seasonal basis. The next concept I'd like to talk about is the telescoping ecosystem concept, and in a way, it's really similar um, to the, um, um, the the spiraling concept we talked about before. Um, and, this, and it uses not uptake length, but processing length um, in various parts of the stream ecosystem. Here we have surface stream, the hyporheic, the parafluvial, that's around the stream, and this is riparian. And 
um, in a pre-disturbance uh, pre late successional stream, um, we, uh, the processing length may be very, um, very short. But when we disturb a system, oftentimes what we do is we cause the biota and the uptake rate of material to change, especially in the stream system, but may be also in the hyperreic and parafluvial, so that we telescope out the uh, processing length of that stream and basically the functioning of that stream goes uh, ha um, has to flow much farther before the function is achieved. With major disturbances, uh, we may see a great scoping out, also processing within the riparian, the parafluvial, the hyperreic, and the surface stream. And now, if we restore a system, then the hope is that we can telescope back that um, um, that ecosystem so that the processing length becomes more reduced. The next concept, stream concept, I'd like to talk about is the aquatic terrestrial ecotone, and that's very similar to, sort of to the flood pulse um, uh, concept. And ecotone um, is a sort of transition between two kinds of ecosystems, and the ecotone between the terrestrial and aquatic and streams um, are, these are areas of high diversity of organisms and ecosystem processes. Aquatic and terrestrial ecotone, uh, ecotones have continual flow of bio biomass and nutrients across that ecotone, which influences surrounding ecological processes. And so streams are in constant exchange with terrestrial systems and vice versa. So the uh, aquatic terrestrial ecotone is important. Insects also have life stages which disperse and use both of those um, uh, parts of the ecotone, and so they may, in fact, uh, cross material back across between the stream and the terrestrial ecosystem or across that ecotonal gradient. Here uh, is another diagram of the terrestrial uh, aquatic terrestrial ecotone, and here we have uh, a series of functional units, um, and uh, which usually all these uh, acronyms in my live class usually get a pretty good laugh. Uh, but we have exchanges of material, and we have here then the, um, you know, we have the water functional unit, we have the coarse sediment functional un unit, the, um, uh, the hyporheic functional unit, and the macrophyte functional unit, as well as the terrestrial, the TFU is a terrestrial. And basically we're just showing these exchanges across th these various um, ter aquatic terrestrial ecotones in different areas, including the macrophytic sort of riparian zone, the terrestrial zone, also into the hyporheos, and um, there are great exchanges of materials, and then great gradients of the kinds of organisms that live there. <clears throat> Another concept I'd like to review having to do with streams is the catchment hierarchy. And um, it, it probably has occurred to you that a downstream in a large river, there's a lot less variability over time than there is in the upstream. And if you looked at all of the catchments, at the very so the first order catchments, you'd probably find a lot more variation in function and characteristics among those many um, uh, primary catchments uh, than you would find um, in higher order catchments. So primary catchments follow the main river courses, and then there are secondary, tertiary, and quaternary catchments that follow successively smaller uh, tributaries. Um, the emphasis then of this catchment hierarchy concept is on longitudinal, lateral, and vertical dimensions that can be integrated into this framework of, the, of, pat, of sort of the patch dynamics concept. Patch dynamics focuses on interactions and changes in patches in the ecosystem, and this catchment hierarchy offers a very natural kind of um, a patch, um, a, a patchwork of systems that work and function in different ways. And then human disturbances can act over a range of catchment hierarchies, altering eventually uh, even major aspects of overall uh, primary uh, catchments. Another concept I'd like to review briefly is uh, that of hydrologic connectivity. And in areas, of course, where we and in areas of where we uh, find um, uh, where, where we find different kinds of hydrology changes made, we find that um, the hydrologic connectivity is extremely important. 
Uh, interestingly enough, we maintain a great deal of ecosystem health by keeping hydrologic connectivity relatively low, so the water has to kind of work harder and go slower as it moves downstream. There's a water-mediated transfer of matter, energy, or organisms within and between the elements of the hydrologic cycle. Um, this is influenced by a, a whole bunch of things, including saturation, infiltration, basically plumbing of, um, of catchment uh, systems. And then there also are geomorphic features, such as slopes and valley fills and floods, that alter this catchment uh, connectivity. Hill slope and runoff and eroded sediment comes into into streams, and uh, the greater the hydrologic connectivity, the greater the flashiness and impact it will have. Depending on the connectivity, there can be a fairly long time lag or a short one. And um, hydrologic connectivity of stream systems also has a very large um, um, positive effect on migratory fish, a negative effect uh, on uh, the intrusion while it's actually positive effect on the transmission of exotic uh, exotic organisms um, and also affects uh, dispersal and overall integrity of the landscape and the waterscape. There are different theories that incorporate different sorts of dimensions and um, these uh, there uh, if we look at uh, the lodic ecology concept here in the middle and all the ones we've talked about some of them are uh, a uh, as I mentioned earlier, are um, are oriented around gradients, some around disturbance, some around ecotones, hierarchy, and connectivity. But if you take a sort of a four-dimensional perspective, some of these have more uh, have more uh, relevance to different sorts of perspectives. Uh, stream zonation, of course, is on a longitudinal um, uh, perspective. Also, the river continuum concept is principally um, a one of longitude, although can have temporal consequences, whereas the hyporrhea corridor concept um, is a longitudinal, lateral, and vertical, so moving up and down and uh, out, and also all of them can vary in some temporal sort of way. Um, the serial discontinuity is more or less longitudinal and lateral without too much consideration of the vertical, sort of the up and down but the telescoping ecosystem concept, well, pu flood pulse is mostly a lateral flux moving outward onto the floodplain. Telescoping ecosystem concept is uh, is organized around sort of vertical um, uh, vertical perspectives and temporal ones as the ecosystem changes over time, and then uh, aquatic ecotonal aquatic terrestrial ecotonal concepts are um, oriented around ideas of lateral and vertical transport. Um, catchment hierarchy obviously is longitudinal and hydrologic connectivity is more or less a question of lateral transport as well as temporal variation in, um, in, the, net, in, the, in the overall stream network. Now large, uh, large and small uh, rivers um, alter are, are quite different to study and um, mostly I found that there are sort of um, large river limnologists and small river limnologists. But um, the, the, of course, uh, um, the distinction between large and small rivers is kind of arbitrary. But w one thing that distinguishes them quite well is it's sort of the amount of, of water depth and turbulence and exposure to sunlight. Also, um, the ratio between lodic and lentic areas in a stream has a big effect. So um, the um, large rivers tend to have much more lentic area than lodic area. And um, species richness also varies a great deal uh, along, uh, and, and specific kinds of species varies uh, phen uh, phenomenally between uh, large and small rivers. And of course, flooding, um, flooding concepts having to do with flashy watersheds that we've talked about in previous sessions and sort of long-term rains and snow melt, all sort of uh, are, are the effects are quite different between the large and small rivers. And the reason that, that's Im important for us to consider these things is that there are various uh, considerations for our very practical considerations having not only to do with the ecology, but sampling surveys with the equipment we need and just general safety of scientists as they study these. They're very different. Studying a large 
uh, most people can walk out into a small first order stream and studying study it, but it takes much uh, greater equipment to study, say, a tenth order river. Now, um, this also has some effect on fish species for those of you who are quite interested uh, in uh, fish. Um, and uh, the, uh, there are traits, in including sort of trophic uh, preference and locomotion morphology, that will vary uh, between um, small streams and large streams. But uh, in the table uh, that I'm showing you here, um, there are different categories of streams. And what I wanted you to see from this is that there are different kinds of reproductive strategies that are functional, uh, better functional in small streams than large ones. And um, in large rivers, of course, um, uh, the uh, reproductive um, strategies are, are much more aligned with sort of broadcast and sort of migratory upstream, downstream sorts of behavior than um, things like uh, simple nesting and nester garter sorts of reproduction that you'd find in smaller, shallower, more sort of manageable, um, less um, dynamic systems. Um, I also wanted to mention that a bird species, um, uh, many, many bird species rely on rivers and river networks. And um, you can kind of get some sense of how many species there are in various river networks around the world. This, show, this map shows the species richness of specialist riverine birds around the world. And um, uh, you can see that places where they're very abundant, uh, these river networks are very complex. And uh, there are many specialist riverine birds in um, North America, where I mostly work. Um, the um, number of specialties, specialist riverine birds are, are, are very few, but many places around the world, they are very, very abundant and rely on good, healthy river um, uh, ecosystems. So uh, uh, running waters have been modified in, in a lot of different ways, and one should keep aware of these. And I mentioned already dams and impoundments as a major um, a, a modification clearly turns a running water into essentially a lentic ecosystem. Also, land use patterns really have changed the way rivers work. And in some areas where things like agricultural development are very, very uh, uh, prevalent, they've changed the whole hydro hydraulic. This has changed the whole hydraulic structure, as well as the kinds of sediments and habitats that are available in streams. And other modifications to running waters that have become really important recently are the intrusion of various invasive species. Um, I mentioned the Asian clam, the zebra mussel. Um, we have uh, uh, other kinds of invasive species that are causing changes to uh, uh, running waters, as well as the imperilment of the biota. And um, in one area where I've worked that used to be a center for freshwater mussel biodiversity on the planet with over 50 species of um, freshwater mussels. Uh, just the changes in the landscape, the modifications of these r running waters have essentially eradicated most of the habitat. And we've dropped to only 22 species of freshwater mussels in that a particular area. So modification has been large and has had a large effect on the biota of these ecosystems. Now, there are lots of uses for dams, and we shouldn't run those down, really. They've been really a, a, an important source of hydropower, for example. And I talked earlier about uh, dam removal uh, giving us back natural streams, but it also takes away um, uh, some uh, lacustrine habitat that's important for recreation and takes away uh, lacustrine or, or lake-like ecosystems. Also, dams have been very important in supplying water for human consumption. In one of the earlier sessions, uh, we, I mentioned that 75% of all um, surface water, uh, sorry, 75% of all um, drinking water um, or with water withdrawals for human use in uh, the United States uh, come from surface waters. And it's, it's useful to uh, dam it up so that you have a um, continuous supply of it. Also, irrigation uh, of agricultural lands is one of the most rapidly growing uses of water. And well, again, one needs a, um, a, a constant source of that water, so impoundment is quite important. Also, dams are very important for flood control. Excuse me. As, um, as we have drained uh, water off the land faster, floods have become 
more um, substantial. And as uh, climate change increases the amount of um, uh, sort of violent storms, uh, of the sort of the um, amount and severity of storm um, precipitation, flood control will be uh, a, a very uh, Im even more important aspect. And in many cases, uh, dams have been built um, as political and public works projects basically to keep people employed, and dams are helpful in ensuring navigation upstream and downstream. Um, uh, the Mississippi River, for example, in the United States is completely controlled by a series of locks and dams that allow large vessels to move upstream and move goods upstream and downstream. And um, uh, dams are very useful for tourism, as I mentioned before. And there are several examples of really important uh, recreational waters that have been created uh, by dams. So there are some very positive aspects. Uh, dams have, um, uh, uh, these are shows a bunch of states in the United States, um, uh, in the yellow bars of uh, different states who get a lot of energy from hydropower. Some places uh, receive most of their energy from hydropower. Um, also, uh, looking in the world uh, about uh, the billion kilowatt hours of, of energy that have been created by hydro hydroelectric power, Canada is number one, United States is number two, former USSR nations next, and Brazil and China and so on. And China, of course, is increasing really uh, rapidly with the uh, uh, construction of major uh, major dams. Canada, for example, uh, also produces 70% of its electricity from hydroelectric sources, um, and this uh, and um, this is 23% of the total electricity, also in California. So important uh, dams can be very important. Uh, on the other hand, dams uh, create a, an impediment to fish uh, movement, and um, and also uh, the uh, really the alteration of previously uh, fluvial habitat into lacustrine habitat. And uh, dam removals have, been, have become really quite uh, frequent um, in various places in the world as we perhaps n we want to decommission them, they become unsafe, or we want to simply reclaim, um, um, reclaim, the, um, um, reclaim that um, riparian corridor and stream habitat. And I just want to show you one of these, which is really quite fun to watch. There are tons of them, of course, um, on um, uh, on YouTube or other places. But this is one. Uh, this is a National Geographic film, and the credit uh, credit for production of it is at the end. And I'd like to give all due credit. But uh, this starts out slowly as they uh, uh, blow the underside of the dam and allow water to begin to to flow. And you'll notice a variety of Things and I'll sort of narrate as we go along, uh, but this is um, um, well. Here we go. Let's just have a look at it. So watch this area down here as they dynamite it. They're going to blow this part here. This is upstream from the dam. You see the dam in the distance. Now you'll notice that the, sed the water coming out is very sediment laden. It almost looks like soil. And what it's doing now, since they've um, they blew a hole in the bottom of the dam, it's pulling the um, say 100 years or 60 or 70 years or so of accumulated sediment that's been held in that um, in that lake ecosystem. We'll get to this in uh, in the future when we talk about carbon sequestration. Um, but it's, it's an amazing amount of carbon and well-preserved material that's going downstream. Not a really beautiful stream ecosystem uh, downstream as you uh, look at this um, water flow. Now soon this will move into time lapse and you, um, you'll you notice that people, I see the time lapse, look at the level decreasing and people gather up here to watch it go go down and um, it's a very slur big slurry of mud, water surface dropping. The whole process took about two hours. It was really pretty violent. And, uh, and you'll see big slumps of sediment moving downstream. There's one of them. Huge amount of erosion. And basically this, um, this lake um, created this 
huge amount of sediment or rich organic sediment here old trees that were impounded a century beforehand um, and are still well preserved uh, downstream we'll talk about that also when we talk about paleo work amazing thing and uh, this was a, a, a wonderfully interesting film and there are lots of uh, even more spectacular ones on the internet that uh, you could have a look at it's quite amazing um, so uh, levees are also are, are parts of the alteration of streams and um, this is of course New Orleans being flooded a levee as we've learned in previous sessions is a natural or artificial embankment or dike it's usually earthen and it parallels the course of the river and really changes how they work in general in the world um, river channels have been greatly fragmented and the colors indicate the degree of river channel fragmentation and this of course has a big effect on the river biota and the function of the system so green yellow and red indicate unimpacted moderately impacted and strongly impacted catchments and um, you can look at wherever it is in the world you live and see the degree of um, change that's been created uh, by um, by uh, river channel fragmentation that is breaking it up by various dams, by locks, by wing dams, and other structures. Um, generally, uh, in North America, uh, we have pretty much fragmented these watersheds, and um, you can, um, and in many other places in the world as well. And I don't think it's decreasing terribly, even though we do take out a dam or two from time to time. Land use patterns also have big effects on stream function and uh, the water levels uh, and water quality are both parts of the alteration due to land use change and land use change will affect erosion rates from the land, discharge of various materials, water use rates and changes, vegetation cover, runoff rates and basically changes the community composition um, and, uh, and here we see uh, sort of the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. This is a case of erosion. Uh, mo we have mowed grass, heavy foot traffic, and a bend in the river that's changed erosion. You can see this in a, in, as we change land use patterns in general around stream corridors. And of course, as we increase the uh, flow rate, the stream velocity, and move water off the land more rapidly, we alter, we move ourselves from deposition to transport of sediment, to erosion of sediment, and downstream transport. As you saw actually in that dam break, increase velocity and move that uh, sediment very fast. Erosion is part of the breakdown and removal of material, and transport, which is the movement of material down, down the river. Deposition is, which is the, uh, is the accumulation of material along banks and beds of, uh, of rivers. And so this changes with velocity, and land use alters velocity of flow, and, um, and the flow um, uh, of material or the flux of water into any stream or river. Invasive species, as I mentioned before, have uh, been transported by stream connectivity. Uh, here we see the distribution of Dracaena polymorpha, the zebra mussel, uh, here in 2014. And you can see that it's moving, uh, moving up along this river corridor um, and um, in many other along many other river corridors in the United States. Some other things would be sort of the slimy sculpin, the, the lampreys have been moved along, Bithytrephus is also uh, moving um, and is moved uh, by streams. There's a constant kind of um, 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 push and pull uh, between the desire to have upstream tr uh, migration of natural healthy organisms and the desire to block the migration of ones that will destroy organisms and so this there's a uh, the, there's a, a conflict really between uh, restoring uh, uh, natural biota and protecting the natural biota from invasive exotic organisms here's a nice picture sort of a stream biota I haven't shown very many video clips of what streams and rivers look like um, you can find these yourselves they're tremendously important and um, active ecosystems with a huge variety of different kinds of organisms that live in them. So as a summary of lotic ecology, rivers and lakes differ in, in most physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. They're very diverse environments, but despite all that, kind of the same types of organisms uh, live in the benthos of both rivers and lakes. 
river continuum concept is probably the main theory um, that uh, about lentic ecology. It's certainly a predominant one, but there are many others that explain stream function, and we try to review some of those. Um, riffle, riffle and pool zones have differing biota, and then the hyporheic zone is a really special zone. That's sort of the confluence then of um, groundwater as well as surface water flow. The energy source is allochthonous in the upstreams, becomes autochthonous as you move downstream, or at least um, composed of finer, more finely divided allochthonous particulate matter. Four different kinds of organisms we talked about that have importance in that sort of river continuum concept are the shredders, collectors, scrapers, and predators. And those are the main trophic types. And, you know, they're not obviously mutually exclusive. There are some that do uh, diverse, um, uh, uh, do s a couple of those types of things. Uh, but, uh, in fact, those are useful conceptual areas to think about how streams differ as one moves from upstream to downstream. And then uh, ecotones have, uh, ecotones between aquatic and terrestrial zones have um, a, a relevance both for streams and, um, and terrestrial environments. And ecotonal concepts are, are linked to hydrological connectivity also, um, but also there are many kinds of aspects, ecotones, hydrologic connectivity, and floods and flood pulse concepts that um, exchange materials between the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. In fact, the action of the um, lotic, um, lotic benthos, especially the insects, exchanges material really readily between aquatic and terrestrial environments. And also I just wanted to finish with the concept that humans have really modified streams and we've done so in many different ways that have altered the, the stream so that we now have very few unaltered stream corridors. And we've done this by adding dams, by channelizing streams, by altered land use, and uh, more and more now through the introduction of various invasive species.